Welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with our guest Gareth from IUR Capital in the UK. So welcome, everyone. Uh, before we get started, a quick disclosure. The Capital Discussions is not a broker-dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented, however, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. So with that out of the way, I'll stop sharing and uh, welcome back, Gareth. It's uh, always a pleasure. Let me uh, get you the presenter role. There you go. So you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, thanks. Uh, give me one moment. I'm just going to uh, do the upload from my side. Here we go. Okay. Okay, let's make sure these are the right ones. Yeah. Okay, so everyone should see that um, over on the left, uh, the uh, the cover slide. Okay, so um, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's just after 4 p.m. London time, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so yes, we're. Um, it looks like we still have some people joining us. Always uh, better late than never. Uh, so thanks for coming along. Um, as I mentioned, the cover slide is over on the left. Um, I'm going to keep the chat panel open. So this is an interactive webinar, which means that you can, of course, uh, in the roundtable format, you can use the chat panel to send any questions or comments uh, to myself during the uh, the event. Okay. Uh, one other final point, that guy in the middle of the screen, that's, uh, that's not me. I'm, of course, uh, much better looking than that guy. Okay, now, risk disclosure for all of you. I know uh, that Tom has just um, uh, gone through one of the uh, capital discussions disclaimers with you, but this is our own. Um, folks, options are leveraged products that involve risk and of course are not suitable for all investors. Before you commit your capital to any option strategy, uh, please obtain a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options provided by the Options Industry Council. You can also obtain a copy on uh, that link. Uh, IUR is an investment advisor firm registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission and authorized and regulated by the UK Financial Conduct Authority. We do not hold any client funds Client accounts are held at a federal regulated broker dealer and clearing firm. Uh, neither the presenter, that's myself, or IUR is a FINRA registered representative. IUR is not affiliated with any broker dealer uh, as well. None of the content discussed in this presentation carries an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any security or operate any specific strategy. Any securities uh, included in this presentation are for illustrative purposes only and, of course, are not intended as recommendations. Executions fees for U.S. option contracts will vary based on the broker-dealer and where multi-leg strategies, including spreads, are discussed, the execution fee is generally per leg and therefore multiple commissions will apply. Uh, any information provided in this presentation is believed to be accurate, but the accuracy and completeness of the information is not guaranteed. Investors should not rely on any information for the maintenance of books and records or for tax accounting, financial or regulatory reporting. And lastly, and most importantly, past performance is not indicative of future results. Okay? Uh, you can obtain a copy of the slides for today's webinar from myself. The email address will be provided at the end and also throughout the presentation. Okay, so for anyone here that hasn't been to one of um, our uh, webinars before, um, always good to get a bit of background on uh, myself, the presenter. Folks, I'm the founder and managing director here at IUR Capital. And as you can see, uh, I started my own trading career at a very young age. Originally, I was a Euro-dollar currency trader before going on to work in the options brokering industry. And of course, that's what we specialize here uh, on the, here in IUR. I set up IUR in 2007. And as I mentioned, we are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission as 
investment advisor firm and regulated with the UK Financial Conduct Authority. A lot of our business is done as an investment advisor on the IBTWS advisor platform. And we're going to spend a little bit of time during today's uh, webinar talking about uh, that as well. Now, um, I did want to actually uh, go through a um, just a, a performance update for all of you. So this is where I will actually do a brief uh, screen share. So you're going to see my screen in just a second. So what I'll do is I'll give you a brief summary of 2016 performance and also, of course, how we've been doing uh, during early 2017. So this is a portfolio snapshot for the S&P 500 index credit spread strategy um, that we operate for our clients on the Interactive Brokers platform. Now, um, over on the right, uh, you can see the key figures. Um, this figure right here, that's the cumulative return for the full year. Uh, that is net of a 2.5% annual management fee, but it's gross of any year-end performance fee, which as standard is 20% of the capital gains. Okay. Over on the left is your uh, blue line. That's the strategy performance on the top, and the green line is the underlying benchmark. That's the SPX or Spider uh, in this case. Okay. So last year was a very solid year for us um, on this credit spread strategy performance. Please bear in mind that it's not just the credit spread strategy. It also involves a hedge overlay, which I'm going to talk about uh, during the uh, the period of today's webinar where we are in the Interactive Brokers platform, okay? So it's not unhedged credit spreads where we just sell outright put spread or call spread premium on the underlying security. There is a hedge being applied uh, at the same time, okay? You can obtain a copy of this uh, and the brokerage account statement, which is uh, below. Uh, here we go. Um, it's a little bit slow loading, but folks, you can obtain a copy of that performance report, as I mentioned, here we go, the uh, brokerage account statement as well uh, directly from myself at the, uh, the end of the webinar. This is quite a long document because it does actually include a full breakdown of all the trades that were made to generate that return in premium for 2016. Okay, so that's, um, as I mentioned, that's uh, the past uh, a year uh, from uh, the beginning of last year right through to the end. As I mentioned, there is a hedge overlay as well. Now, January of 2017, let's take a quick look. Um, we should have February figures available pretty soon, but basically in January, we were about 4.5% for the month, again, on the credit spread strategy. Uh, and again, that is net of 2.5% annual management fee for the month. Um, but gross of any year-end performance fee, and that is as standard uh, 20%. Again, it does include this performance report, the actual brokerage account statement, and a full breakdown of all fees and commissions paid um, by the account. This is a proprietary account that we operate here at IUR uh, to run this credit spread strategy, and of course, we also seek to run this uh, strategy for our client accounts as well. Okay, any questions on that, you can ask me uh, throughout today's webinar or um, at, the, um, at the end. Target for this year is 40% net of all fees, annual management fees, and any performance fee applied at year end. All right, okay, so I'm going to bring you back into the uh, WebEx platform. Okay, so... Um, I can see we've just had a few more people join. Thanks for joining us late, folks. Uh, hopefully you've uh, managed to allocate um, about a half an hour to 45 minutes with us for today's webinar. Um, a brief market update before I get into charts. Uh, so folks, we're about 7% for the year on SPX. That's for Jan and Feb. Um, a, a good chunk of that happened just yesterday, March 1, after the um, after the, uh, the, the presidential speech in Congress on Tuesday evening. Volatility still remaining near all-time lows in the high single digits um, and low double digits on the volatility index. Um, February was a very solid month, as you all know, for equity indexes. Um, we're expecting a, a, a rate hike this month, 
um, which will be in a couple of weeks. And overall, we're expecting two to three rate hikes uh, this year. Um, we could talk all day about what's happened uh, during the past few weeks, folks, for equity markets. Um, we'll, we'll do a bit of that during our discussion on the charts in the upcoming slides. But um, needless to say that as markets have moved higher exponentially, uh, we've got more short covering going on, and of course that creates further upward momentum for uh, equity indexes. Okay, so a lot of bullish momentum out there, certainly. Um, you know, we can talk, as I mentioned all day, about the catalysts for it. One thing I would say is that the market is most likely now fully pricing in a significant cut in uh, business tax and corporation tax rates uh, in the U.S. So apparently, uh, the, uh, the president would like to cut corporation tax in half. So if he holds true to that promise, then um, this rally will have been justified since, uh, since November. Okay? Okay, so before we get to the charts, um, opportunities for this year. Um, folks, last year we had a lot of sideways action for equity indexes. As I mentioned, SPX was about 10% for the year, but about 4 or 5% of that, almost half of that return, was generated in the final two months of the year. Uh, before that, we had a prolonged periods of sideways action, which some option strategies will benefit from, others won't. Um, generally, gamma buyers, that means call buyers or put buyers throughout last year, would have uh, continually lost uh, value on their positions purely out of a lack of direction. Um, and as you'll see in the upcoming slides, there were certain periods last year where certain option strategies that were neutral um, in their outlook would have generated a consistent premium to the portfolio without any real move in the underlying index. Okay, and we're going to talk about SPX in particular. So, folks, we do a lot of different things with different clients, but as anyone will know from, uh, from our previous webinars, one thing we do focus on is trying to generate returns on an annual basis uh, using premium harvesting strategies that are decorrelated to the underlying index. There may be some correlation during periods of the year to the underlying index, but generally what we're looking for is positive returns regardless of whether the market's uh, rallying, whether it's sideways or whether it's selling off. Okay, so that's the core objective of the credit spread strategy that we're going to talk about today and also more particularly with the, uh, with the, uh, the hedging program that we, uh, that we operate. Okay, so um, a couple of charts to get through with you. Firstly, this is the one year on SPX. Um, bottom left to top right looks very attractive for anyone along the market. Um, this is courtesy of the Interactive Brokers platform. So where were we in March of last year? Well, folks, we were coming off that 12% correction, a very nasty correction at the beginning of last year, um, which saw a lot of um, weird and wonderful things taking place, not just in equity markets, but in commodities as well. Um, as you can see, we rallied to all-time highs uh, during May and June, but then we get to this period right in the middle of the screen. Um, between early July and early September. Folks, this was a particularly interesting period, not for realized volatility, but for premium harvesting strategies to go to work. As some of you will know, um, with the advent of weeklies, um, on top of traditional monthlies, that presents even more opportunity for premium harvesting strategies to work in a very short period of time. That means within the final 30 days of expiry. Now, during that period, from July to early September, about eight or nine weeks, we had, as I mentioned, all-time lows in terms of realized volatility. That's great for neutral outlooks, okay? Neutral approach uh, whereby you're uh, running perhaps an iron condor approach or even a butterfly uh, that seeks to extract premium on a continual basis. Take a look at price action in SPX. We went from about 2150 up to 2200, but throughout that almost two and a half month period, we never really moved outside that 50-point range on SPX. So you're taking advantage. If you're an active options uh, trader and you're running an options portfolio, that period was perhaps the most important of last year for us. Not necessarily the rally that took place at the end of the year, but this in a very low realized volatility environment, how much premium can be extracted. This is where you get to outperform uh, the long equity portfolio, which in this period would likely have done nothing or yielded only a, a very small return outright. So iron condors, um, short call spreads, and then short put spreads combined, and some form of the, of the butterfly 
um, or even a calendar, uh, perhaps, uh, that seeks to harvest premium. All of those would have done uh, pretty well during that period. Of course, things changed to the upside um, in, uh, in November, as you can see over on the right of the screen. That's where, as I mentioned, almost half of the annual return for SPX took place during the final few weeks of last year. Okay, so it was an interesting chart to look at um, based on the fact that, as I mentioned, different option strategies can work during different periods. One final point about the MACD, on the bottom, as you can see, at the end of last year, it did in indicate the market was overbought, um, but not to the extent uh, in November uh, of, um, of the previous year. So we've had some mildly overbought and oversold conditions, but in most cases, folks, the market remained uh, oversold during uh, August of last year in particular. You can see that on the, um, on the bottom. Okay, so, um, yeah, there's a few things you can say about this, as I mentioned. I know a lot of you do, do different option strategies based on your outlook, um, but for us, the key objective is being able to generate a consistent premium to the portfolio that, as I mentioned, decorrelated or has low correlation to the underlying index. Let's take a look at implied versus realized. Um, remember, folks, options are driven by volatility. High volatility means high option premium. Low volatility means low option premiums. Um, you can benefit from that um, how you like if you're uh, taking volatility-based strategies. Folks, the concept for today's webinar is primarily on premium harvesting, not necessarily on volatility. But regardless of what you're doing in the options market, folks, you need to understand how important volatility is and how it's driving um, the outlook for option pricing. So this is a comparison of the implied versus the realized, blue being uh, the implied, the white being the realized or sometimes called historical vol. So what do you notice about last year? Firstly, the fact that we had three or four pockets of elevated vol last year. You all know when those took place. Of course, the, um, the Brexit sell-off over on the left of center. Um, then again, in early September, we had a very short period of just a few days where Val uh, went back to mid-teens. Then once again, in October and finally at the end of October, early November, when volatility revisited those, uh, those Brexit levels. Of course, that's all factoring in a significant move on the outcome of the presidential election. But here's the important part about that. Look how quickly we had a key reversal in the Val. Okay? We didn't have elevated volatility for several weeks. Instead, we had a spike of um, near-term vol and then a very sharp reversal to the downside. Look how quickly we revisited the low 12, 13 level on, on the VIX, just in a matter of days, okay? What does that imply for you? It generally means that when you convert this into sentiment in the equity markets, remember that the volatility index, it moves inversely to SPX about 80% of the time. So it's got a reasonably high degree of accuracy, okay, on an inverse basis. If you're looking at what's happening with the volatility index and how sharp those reversals are to the downside, to us that means, if you want to convert that into equity market sentiment, it generally means the buy-the-dip mentality has prevailed and that generally results in lower volatility um, or declining volatility as new money comes into the market and goes to work on the, on the S&P. So, yeah, that summarizes what happened last year. Over towards the right of the screen, you can see we've only gone one way on both realized and implied um, over the past few months. And now, in the very bottom right of the screen, you can see realized is back to mid-single digits on SPX. So, Consider how this impacts your portfolio if you're long gamma or if you're short gamma. As I mentioned, we generally are a seller of premium. That means we normally have short gamma exposure and, of course, short vega exposure as well, which means we have to accept uh, the fact that we're dealing in a very low part of the volatility surface. Okay. As I mentioned, realize back to mid-single digits. Um, there are some outlier days, like yesterday, where we do get moves outside of the realized, um, but of course, that simply means declining implied vol as well. Okay, so any questions about that um, particular chart? I think it's very important for anyone here trying to understand um, how uh, the realized and implied matter when it comes to option pricing. Now, one final point. Um, 
with regards to what's out there on the horizon for Val um, for May and June, folks, as you know, we've got some big elections taking place over here in Europe uh, this year. First up is the Frexit or the French presidential elections. Um, there are some notable um, uh, periods during the expiries out there on the term structure for May and June uh, where we've got implied vol on the, on, the, uh, on the rise. And that means you've got volatility buyers in there looking to profit from any uh, spike in the vol during those periods. Okay? So it's not all depressed vol, folks. There are some periods of the year where it will get interesting. Um, it's unlikely that we're going to stay here forever because, of course, when vol is down at 10 or 11, uh, generally that means there's a lot more upside potential and downside. Okay? All right, so um, I know a lot of you are in the retail investor camp. We normally include these two slides in all of our webinars because it helps us give you some perspective of your scenario. Not all of you will fit into these two scenarios, but I know that a good portion of you will. So first scenario, for 2017 in your approach for this year, it's likely you've had a reasonably good start to the year if you're self-managing your, uh, your equity portfolio. Um, it's likely that you're in the 40 to 60 age range, um, likely married with little or no dependents. Okay. You've got some income, but you need to supplement that um, with your current portfolio. And as I mentioned, maybe you've had a, a good start to the year, but things eventually will level out everyone. And the market doesn't go up in perpetuity, day in, day out, and that's where you need to factor in either a pullback or a leveling out of equity market, um, particularly on SPX. So it's likely you've got some exposure to bonds, some mutual funds and dividend paying stocks in your portfolio. But as I mentioned, you are looking to generate a consistent income, but with a focus on capital preservation. This is where a portion of the, uh, of the, uh, the overall portfolio, let's say in this example, 15 to 20%, could be allocated to a conservative option strategy that seeks to generate regular premium. I'm talking about premium harvesting here, and that's where, of course, the credit spread strategy is one of those strategies that could be used. Scenario two, um, something similar, except in this case, it's likely a retirement account of some form. Um, you're either nearing retirement or you're already in retirement with little or no dependents. It's likely your income has dropped, but you're worried that you still, of course, have expenses and you do still require uh, a consistent income to the portfolio. Again, you're mostly invested in uh, treasuries or, or corporate bonds, perhaps, with a small exposure uh, to equities, uh, which, of course, provide you with dividend income. But your main problem, your biggest issue, is that it's not sufficient for regular drawdowns. This is where you need to prioritize. You don't want to focus on reserving your capital in the retirement account, but you need to generate income as well to the portfolio, okay, above and beyond what you're generating right now. Again, this is where a portion of the account assets could be allocated to a premium harvesting strategy. This is what we're talking about during uh, both today's webinar and also in our upcoming webinars. Now, um, it's important that you understand the difference between income seeking and volatility strategies. Okay, we've broken this down on this table here because I know a lot of you will be familiar with these strategies, but it's important to differentiate between them because if you look at something like a covered call strategy or a credit spread, it's primarily premium based. Okay, yes, you're concerned about volatility. You need to keep an eye out on volatility, but that's not how you're generating the return. Your return is being generated through the premium uh, that you're selling. Okay, either on the covered call program, uh, which we do run, uh, by the way, folks, for a lot of our client portfolios, um, separate from any uh, spread-based strategies. But on the left side as well, the iron condor, of course, the credit spread and the butterfly, all could be considered premium-based option strategies. Over on the right, things are a little bit different because that's where if you're going out there and being a buyer of a straddle or a buyer of a strangle, for example, you're going to be long vega. And it's most likely that you're thinking, you know what? Today, we've got the VIX around 11 or 12. Um, we're looking for that to move back to the mid-teens. If that's the case, then that's where you want to get into long volatility-based strategies. Your return will be benefit. Your return, I should say, will, uh, will be uh, derived from any increase in the volatility. Okay, three things that we always like to, uh, to sell about the, uh, the credit spread itself. Time decay, direction of the underlying, and volatility. Remember that as a seller, premium time is always on your side, particularly during the final 30 days of the, uh, of the, uh, the position. That's, of course, where time decay becomes nonlinear 
and theta really starts to earn uh, itself during that period. Of course, you've got some exposure to the underlying, but of course, depending on how close to at the money you are as a seller of premium, you will either have high delta or reasonable delta exposure relative to uh, the underlying security. Now, um, we've got a roadmap here, which could also be considered a path dependency uh, when it comes to option strategies. Folks, there's four things that really form the building blocks for an options portfolio that some of you will be familiar with um, with your existing setup. Market conditions, folks, really have a significant impact on what kind of option strategy we're going to use. Um, it may not be the case that uh, you can use the same option strategy throughout the entire year without any change to it. Uh, I talked earlier about our performance on the S&P 500 index credit spread strategy for last year. Um, the important thing to bear in mind is that although it's considered one strategy being used continually, as I mentioned, there is a hedging overlay going on on top of that credit spread. And of course, an important point to bear in mind is that hedging does drag on returns. So in actual fact, although you, you saw our performance for last year, um, we were, were actually down by about 10 or 15% on that net return, simply on the hedging uh, coming at a continual cost to the portfolio. Okay, that's important to bear in mind. So yes, market conditions really form the top um, part of what we want to uh, do here in terms of premium harvesting. Strike selection, well, if, folks, this is where you get into how sensitive you are to risk. Some of you may not quite understand uh, what your real risk profile is. That's one of the things that we do here at IUR to determine how much risk is suitable for you in the portfolio. Um, for anyone here that's aggressive in terms of their objectives and their, they are less concerned about capital preservation and more concerned about returns, that's of course where if you're running a credit spread strategy, you can really run high delta exposure. Okay, you can start selling weekly premium that's just one or two percent out of the money perhaps, or in the traditional monthlies within three or four percent of that the money. Okay, much higher delta exposure, but of course you're picking up larger amounts of premium. Um, the underlying security, well, folks, we generally don't deviate beyond a basket of underlying securities. We have a preference here for index products, as some of you may know. Um, What's the benefit of index products relative to individual names? Well, of course, you reduce your exposure to any particular name or sector by focusing on those index products. So the usual suspects, everyone, SPX, Spider, the RUT, IWM, NDX, and even the Qs, all big U.S. index products. Over here in Europe, of course, uh, the FTSE, the DAX, uh, eStock50, all big index options uh, products. Uh, that can use premium harvesting strategies. Okay, uh, time horizon. Well, folks, uh, one thing I will say that we've noticed with our own clients in the past couple of years, short-termism. Short-termism is becoming a lot more prevalent when it comes to retail investors. With the advent of mid-weeklies, you can essentially, in any one month, you can basically have at least six or seven opportunities okay, also called expiries, that you can use on one or more option strategies. So this is why um, it's not just about traditional monthlies anymore. It's about what kind of volume is being done on those weeklies and the midweeklies on index products. Uh, there may be periods of the year where we focus entirely within the 30-day time horizon. There may be other periods where we can pick up a lot more premium, but we need to go out there 60 or 90 days okay, uh, pick up a lot higher credits as a seller of premium. This all depends on our outlook. What do we see on the horizon, as I mentioned? The next big event for the market, apart from the rate hike or the expected rate hike this month, is the European elections, okay? Now, I mentioned earlier about the credit spread and the fact that the performance we talked about relates entirely to the S&P 500 index credit spread. Um, I mentioned also that we're not just going out there and running short put spread and short call spreads on the index, okay? Because then we've got outright exposure. We've got a lot of exposure in terms of direction. Um, yes, it's spread based, so we've mitigated some of the risk, but we still have a lot of risk, especially if it's a $5 spread, for example. If we pick up 50 cents credit on a $5 spread, folks, you need to be setting your stops, okay, managing your risk at around $1. 
that's our golden rule for uh, risk management. Folks, always remember that being able, and this is perhaps the most important statement I'm going to make to all of you today, being able to harvest premium successfully over the long term for your options portfolio firstly involves managing risk. Secondly, it involves generating returns. Okay, because remember everyone, these are leveraged products. Your exposure to the underlier will vary based on how close you are to at the money, uh, market conditions, volatility, and other factors. But really what you want to avoid is small deltas becoming big deltas, as they say on, on the floor, uh, with regards to your exposure to being a seller of premium. Okay, this is where hedging comes into place. Now, this one by three setup, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it. It looks something similar to a broken wing butterfly or a hybrid iron butterfly, if you want to call it that, in that you've got short meat, long wings. Okay, But what we've got here is a scenario where we're running this on the put spread side, everyone, not on the call spread side. This is on the S&P 500 index ETF. Now, here's the structure. Uh, three put spreads sold out of the money. One put spread bought at the money or closer to at the money. It's established at zero capital outlay or a small opening net debit. And the objective is simple. You want to extract the credit and move into a net credit position upon the seal of the hedge. Now, we use this on both the weeklies and the monthlies on the S&P 500 index. But as I mentioned, it can also be used on, uh, on other big index products. We've seen this being used on the RUT and IWM quite successfully. And in fact, there is one large fund out there uh, that's doing this one by three setup on the E-mini S&P future options. Okay, um, the one difference is they're doing this on the call spread, but they're doing it in a significant size, uh, one by three call spreads on, uh, on the E-minis. In this case, we're talking about spider ETF. Now, the P&L graph that you see is for illustrative purposes only. Uh, it illustrates the P&L scenario at expiry. The blue line is spider ETF. Okay, so you can see what the approach is here. Um, what you're looking for is to participate in a modest pullback in spider ETF. In this example, it's about 5.5%. You're always looking to be in the green zone, of course, with regards to P&L, but your real sweet spot, or what we call honey trap scenario, is where the hedge, of course, is in the money at expiry, but the short put spreads are still out of the money. This is where things really start to get uh, uh, very acute when it comes to P&L, okay, because you, you have a lot of gamma exposure here, both sides. Um, here's the thing about what we're looking at here, as I mentioned, it's for illustrative purposes only, but I will do, and this is where we get to really bring you into the platform and show you how this is working on our positions, okay, uh, for our client portfolio. So I'm going to do a screen share here with all of you and bring you into the option trader window of the TWS advisor platform with, uh, with interactive brokers. Here we go. Okay, so folks, this is the option trader window um, in TWS. We're looking at the spider security here. Um, all of these are spreads for uh, the March uh, time horizon. There are a couple of Aprils in there as well. Now, what you can see here is three short put spreads and one long put spread. But these two are separate. They're not part of, of this. What I want to focus on is this with you. Okay, um, This is the March 17, the traditional monthly expiry. So you can take a look at what we've got here. Uh, we are essentially short the 224, 229 put spread. Um, we picked up about 25 cents credit. Okay, so let's take a look at this on the one by three setup. Okay, so 25 cents, of course, for every three being sold, we're bringing in, um, basically, we're bringing in about 75 cents credit for every three being sold. But what about the hedge? You can see we're hedging $1 higher. We're buying the 230, 235 put spread, okay? And we're paying something like, uh, it's not, uh, that's not our cost basis, this is current market value. We paid about $1.15, okay? in this case for, uh, for that. I'll just check that uh, net credit in a moment. But if we paid $1.15 for that hedge and we brought in $0.75, cents, then we know that our opening net debit is $0.40. Cents. Okay? Now, folks, that means that our break-even is also $0.40. Cents. We've already extracted, we reduced the size of this during yesterday's rally, okay, above this 
uh, value, but this is current market value. So we're still above break even, about 25 cents above it. Uh, really what we want to be is in a scenario where we can extract as much credit as we can with these expiring out of the money and these being sold as far above the 40 cent break even as we can. That's on the 224, 229, 230, 235, and that's a one by three setup. As you can see, folks, it, um, it, it's getting quite close to our, our break even point where we may actually reduce uh, the size of this further. Um, and in fact, I can just double check that after the, uh, the opening net debit, it may actually be lower than this uh, relative to, uh, uh, to our one by three. But the one by three folks can be used on both the monthlies and the weeklies. Some of you may be asking what's going on with these two. Well, folks, these are not hedged. Okay, these are also March 17 positions, short 220, 225 put spread, and also short the 222 half, 227 half put spread. Why are they not hedged? Well, folks, they were hedged right up until yesterday and Monday. Um, as we saw SPX move higher, these have moved much further out of the money. You can see the deltas are tiny now on both of them. Um, so both of them should expire out of the money, but we will continue to hold uh, at least a residual part of the higher strike hedge on the Spider ETF. What's next for us? Well, folks, you could also look to roll up these put spreads near zero. So buying these back near zero and then rolling up either for the same expiry to extract another transfer premium or rolling up and rolling out to another expiry, perhaps something like the, uh, the March 31 expiry. If we take a look at that briefly, you can see here, folks, we now have mid-weeklies, weeklies, and the monthlies available on Spider ETF. On the March 31, if we take a look at something like uh, below the 230 level, uh, perhaps something like the, uh, let's say, the, the 229, okay, uh, 224 that spread. So if we take a look at that, we can attain a price uh, very quickly on that and we can consider whether this would be a roll-up candidate. So $0.30 cents credit in that case, um, it's likely that we could go perhaps slightly higher uh, to the 224 halves. Let's take a look if there's a price available. Uh, okay, nothing available there on 229 halves, so we'll stick with the 229s. Okay, what is the credit coming in? Well, as I mentioned, it looks like we can bring in about a $0.30 cent credit on that. Folks, that is generally less than our target which is 50 cents credit on traditional monthlies. But remember, we are within the 30-day uh, time horizon for, uh, uh, for this position. So that's one pot potential rule up. And of course, we can hedge that again with 230, 235s if we wish. Uh, let's take a quick look at that also. On uh, the hedge, what is the potential credit or debit scenario uh, in that case? So 230, 235 is what we're looking at. Uh, as the hedge from March 31 on a rollout. Let's take a look. Uh, here we are. Okay, so the 230-235 put spread, it's trading at about 91 cents. Here we go. So you can see very s simply what the scenario will be. We should be able to open up that up at zero capital outlay, folks, or almost zero in terms of uh, opening this up as a roll up. If we did that, then we know that if we open up at zero, we can allow that hedge to decline, let's say it declines to 60 cents during the next 29 days. Well, that's still 60 cents in credit for us. Even if it goes to 40 cents, uh, that most likely means these put spreads are also declining in value that are sitting further out that were short. So perhaps you could set yourself a sealed target of maybe 45 cents which means this declines in value by 50%, but you can still extract 45 cent credit during the month of March, okay? So uh, this is an interesting approach, folks, I can tell you. Um, it's about premium extraction, not necessarily outright premium harvesting, because there is that hedge element involved there, and the hedge really is where your, your value is. That's where your, your credit is on the, uh, on the hedge, okay? Let's take a quick look. Is there any questions here on that? Um, Okay, it looks like we're okay on the Q&A panels at the moment. So, folks, that's, um, as I mentioned, an overview of the one by three. One other thing you may want to bear in mind, there are no call spreads involved here at the moment. However, of course, uh, we're looking at market action. Uh, I think a lot of you will agree. Things look very frothy in terms of valuations for S&P 500 index components, so it may uh, be a time to step in and sell some call spread premium uh, on top of uh, that short put spreads as well. Okay, so let me bring you back into the platform. 
Okay, so that's the one by three um, approach. A couple of things um, to consider about the credit spread out right everyone. It's it's quite a simple concept to to, get, uh, to to grasp in terms of harvesting premium, but as I mentioned, it's got a lot of directional exposure, a credit spread, and that's why, as I mentioned, we do hedge on a continual basis. Um, during periods like the last two or three weeks where SPX has rallied continuously, it does have a downside. It has a drag in our returns, of course, when you're hedging continually because you're dragging on the return. And that can mean actually you may lag the underlying uh, benchmark, uh, the index, during certain periods of the year. That's not a major concern for us, I can tell you that, even though it does mean that we're underperforming on a year-to-date basis, um, folks. Right now, SPX is about 7% for the year. We're just under 7% year-to-date, okay? Um, that's not really what we're focused on. What we're more concerned about is, over the entire 12-month period, how much premium can be harvested with the hedge overlay uh, being applied, okay? Because it's unlikely, folks, I can tell you that, SPX is going to return 40% this year. Okay, that's not in our that's not in our universe of of um, of, uh, of uh, our our outlook for the index. 2013 SPX did generate 30%. I will uh, I will remind you all of that. But of course, that's QE driven, folks. There is no QE now. What we do have is a return of interest rates, um, and of course, that means a higher rate environment, and perhaps higher volatility on the way. So some important things about the credit spread, of course, it's there to generate income, but you do have that directional exposure. It's always one transaction, but at a credit. And of course, you want to avoid a scenario where on a $5 put spread being sold, if you pick up 50 cents credit, really, folks, you want to be keeping your risk, you're limiting your risk at $1. Okay, that's your adjustment territory uh, where you are picking up 10% of the max value of the, um, of the put spread, okay? Uh, now, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, let's take a look here. John is asking, how are we differentiating between premium extraction and premium harvesting? Well, it's quite a fine line, John, but basically, if you're running an outright credit spread strategy, premium is being uh, received into the portfolio at the outset, and your objective is simple, to retain that entire premium. Okay, there is no hedge involved. There's no extraction process involved. It's outright um, uh, premium being received. Extraction of premium is where you may have a, an initial scenario where you open up net debit. You do have that hedge in place, okay, or there is a capital outlay at the beginning. But at some point before expiry, you move into a net credit scenario. That's where you extract the premium or extract the credit upon the seal of the hedge. So, yes, it, it, there is a quite fine line. Both involve income generating strategies, but the approach in terms of risk and uh, um, managing downside and directional exposure will differ uh, between both. John, I'd love to have a chat with you more about the difference between both of them. You can reach out to me uh, after uh, today's webinar. Now, DG is asking, do we start with a net credit or debit always? Okay, um, with regards to the March 17 trade, folks, this is where the weeklies and the monthlies will differ. What you'll find is that you're running a much higher delta line in terms of your exposure on those weeklies because, of course, you're always within uh, one standard deviation or you should be within one SD. That means that uh, daily moves on the underlying index will have a much bigger impact on your P&L. Okay? Um, generally, what we find is on the weeklies, we're opening up net debit because, of course, you're paying a lot more for the hedge. Uh, but we've got a scenario where we've only got a few days, generally, uh, to run the position and to extract as much as we can. It's always better on the weeklies to benefit, of course, from modest pullbacks because, of course, that's where your hedge will really go to work for you uh, in just some softness in the, uh, in the underlying index. Um, well, on the monthlies, things are a bit different, everyone, because on the monthlies, it's a lot less busy, should we say. It's more quiet in terms of, um, you being able to harvest the premium going much further out there, selling premium that is perhaps more than 5% out of the money, and then hedging 2% from out the money. Uh, what you'll find is you could bring in, let's say, 40 cents credit times three, that's a dollar twenty for every three put spreads being sold, but your hedge is only costing you 90 cents. That means you're opening up net credit with about 30 cents, okay? Of course, you are committing your capital to a longer-term time horizon, that's what you need to factor in. Folks, I can tell you that 
this really is an economy of scale because the larger the account and the larger the capital base you have, the more choice you have and the more variability you can uh, generate with regards to combining weeklies and monthlies with, uh, with premium extraction. Okay? Okay, some important things to bear in mind about this year. Well, folks, as I mentioned, there is some big things coming up on the horizon. Uh, last year, it was a presidential election in the U.S. This year, it's the European elections, and, of course, uh, the rate hike as well, or rate hikes uh, that are being planned. Um, monthly objectives, folks, we generally are looking to set a target for, let's say, 2 to 3% per month. That's hedging your credit spread. That's not outright put spread or call spread premium being sold. Okay, of course, your target for monthly objectives will depend on your appetite for risk as well. Focus on a small basket of underlying securities, everyone. It is possible to run credit spread strategies on one by three setups on individual names, but the most liquid products out there are, of course, these index products, and that's why we are a proponent of index products. And, of course, there's nothing wrong with working with uh, with professionals like us. Folks, this is our options advisor account. Um, I've talked a lot about uh, today about uh, what we do with existing clients in terms of um, extracting premium on a continual basis. This is how we work with you on the Interactive Brokers platform. Folks, we work with a lot of professional traders out there. I work with other hedge funds, other investment firms. Um, different clients, as I mentioned, are doing different things with us. Uh, it's really up to you what your objectives are for this year. I've talked about our performance. Um, briefly, what I will do is just bring you back into uh, the, uh, the performance for last year because I know we do have uh, some latecomers. So a reminder, of course, of what we did last year on our proprietary account with this credit spread strategy. Here we go. And again, I will share this with all of you um, after. So this is the, uh, the key return, as I mentioned, for all of you that did join us late. Folks, that's what we did last year on this one by three setup with a credit spread. That return is net of 2.5% annual management fee, but gross of any year-end performance fee, which is standard uh, 20%. Okay, the blue line, once again, is the strategy performance. 2016, the green line being the benchmark. Uh, SPX. And once again, this uh, performance report does include a brokerage account statement uh, underneath uh, where you can view the full trade breakdown of all trades being made last year to generate that return. Okay, so it is quite a long document. You can request that from myself and also our 2017 uh, year-to-date performance on the 1x3 uh, setup. Uh, after uh, today's webinar. In fact, what I will do is I will provide my email address. It's on the next slide. Here we go. So, folks, you can request that uh, performance report and the slides uh, from myself directly. I'd love to have a chat with all of you after at some point, either by email or in a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, WebEx. We can arrange that with all of you after today's webinar. Folks, I'm going to have it back to Tom, um, and I do look forward to being back with you all very soon. Well, thanks, Gareth. It, there was a question from DG right at the end. It says, it looks like you're yes. not always hedged. Yeah, uh, so thanks for that. DJ is asking everyone, it looks like we're not always hedged. Um, on those March trades, for example, we sold the hedges. Yeah, so um, he made a good point there. The objective, of course, of extracting premium is to always be above your break-even. When you've got a market that's rallying day in, day out, your short put spreads are moving much further out of the money, and they're moving into a much lower delta re region. Now, what that means is that your hedge is also declining sharply. You need to extract as much as you can from that hedge before you sell it. Um, in the case of those two short put spreads, they are far enough out of the money not to be our concern now for March 17 expiry. We are more focused on the higher delta, higher gamma positions, um, which are still hedged. And of course, you can see those uh, with the 224, uh, 229, 230, 235 uh, strikes for March 17. So yes, that's a good question, but as I mentioned, there is still a hedge on the higher delta, higher gamma positions. They are really the focus for us now on the portfolio. Is the hedging something new? I know on your equity growth, you had a, a little bit of a drawdown in the middle of that chart. Did yeah. you have hedges um, in place then? Yeah, we actually, that was a weekly setup 
um, basically what happened was at the beginning of September, we went through that period from July to September where we continuously ran weekly strategies for harvesting premium on spider, uh, which were hedged. In the case of that early September scenario, it was a very unique situation where the hedge was sold uh, just a couple of days before expiry. The short put spreads were still out of the money, but we had a very sharp sell-off on the day of expiry, and we had to roll out those short put spreads on the day of expiry to another uh, expiry in order to recover uh, that premium, which we did, as you can see, we did that within a matter of weeks. So although it looks like a, um, a, a quite a sharp drawdown, it was actually rolled out and rolled down um, to another expiry in order to recover that. Sounds good. I noticed it was a quick recovery, but I just was curious about the hedges. Yeah. So I think uh, um, good answer. It looks like we're uh, coming up on an hour anyway, and uh, I think we've finished uh, all your material. So thanks for coming on, Gareth, and uh, we'll uh, set something up every uh, Thursday uh, for every month, the first Thursday at 11. And um, I guess uh, We'll start that in April because this is uh, early March. So yeah. we look forward to well, we having you back. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. We had a, a good turnout today, so thanks for everyone for coming along. Um, uh, some good questions there. Let's, um, you can, again, you can reach out to me directly, everyone, after today's webinar, and I'll be back again with Tom pretty soon. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks, Gareth, and we'll have you back next month. And until then, have good trading, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.